Hi guys, it is a spectacularly gorgeous winter day. I do not believe it, even I, every once in a while, have a gorgeous winter day here <coughs> in the collapse of global industrial civilization. It is now Thursday, December 29th, <coughs> 2022. Two more days, guys. And then we can welcome 2023. And, uh, <laughs> oh boy, here we go again. But, uh, I'm gonna start to wind down 2022. This will be an article that uh, I'm glad to see coming out in Counterpunch because uh, several of you have asked me my opinion on nuclear fusion saving the planet. Uh, <laughs> guys, uh, you obviously know uh, my opinion of nuclear fusion saving the planet. I, I've, I've been over it many times that uh, it, it's a bunch of unadulterated horseshit. And on the hair thin chance that it actually did supply a, you know, a truly a bottomless well of clean, green, free energy, the planet would be destroyed a lot quicker than it's being destroyed by, by fossil fuels. Uh, but, you know, guys, I can't claim that, that I'm some expert in nuclear fusion. It's, it's, I just lump it in and all the rest of this crap uh, but finally, I found a, a good article from those little lefties over there at Counterpunch. You know, these guys at Counterpunch kind of confuse me sometimes. Uh, I, I mean, they're major little lefties, but at the same time, uh, e even the lefties at Counterpunch... Are, are starting to question the bright green lies of the Green New Deal. And uh, so anyway, we're going to listen to this. Uh, I might have read articles by this. Yeah, I have. I, I've read the, several articles over the years by this fellow named Brian Tokar. Brian Tokar has written several books about uh, about climate change and all the rest of how we are or are, are not uh, going to fix this uh, fix this mess. And so anyway, we're going to let Brian. Uh, although Brian uh, doesn't, you know, talk about what would happen if it were successful, uh, which is the worst case of all. He doesn't even go there because he doesn't believe this crap for a second. Anyway, take it away. Brian Tokar, nuclear fusion, don't believe the hype. Don't worry, Brian. Uh, there is no way that I or anyone else with a brain is going to believe the hype, the bright green lie, the techno-utopian lie uh, that nuclear fusion is, is going to uh, either, what's it going to save? Is it going to save the planet? Is it going to save the civilization? Or is it going to save Walmart? Anyway, <clears throat> in a dramatic Scientific and engineering breakthrough, researchers at the Bay Area's Lawrence Livermore National Lab recently achieved the long-sought goal of generating a nuclear fusion reaction that produced more energy than was directly injected into a tiny reactor vessel. By the very next day, pundits well across the political spectrum were touting that breakthrough is a harbinger of a new era in energy production, suggesting a future of limitless, low-impact fusion energy was perhaps 
a few decades away, uh, was perhaps a few decades away. In reality, however, commercially viable nuclear fusion is only infinitesimally closer than it was back in the 1980s when a contained fusion reaction was first achieved. There you go. So, you know, and, and I, when I read this crap, I, I was thinking, haven't we read this story before that they've actually already done this? And uh, they've been doing this since the 1980s. They have uh, pushed the envelope, you know, one nano inch to the uh, edge of the table here. <clears throat> While most honest writers have at least acknowledged the obstacles to commercially scaled fusion, they typically still underestimate them as much so today as back in the 1980s. We are told that a fusion reaction would have to occur many times per second to produce usable amounts of energy. But the blast of energy from the LLNI fusion react reactor actually only lasted one-tenth of one nanosecond. That is a ten billionth of one second. Apparently, other fusion reactions with a net energy loss have operated for a few nanoseconds, but reproducing this reaction over a billion times every second is far beyond what researchers are even contemplating. We are told that the reactor produced about one and a half times the amount of energy that was input, but this only counts the laser energy that actually struck the reactor vessel. That energy which is necessary to generate temperatures over 100 million degrees was the product of an array of 192 high-powered lasers which required well over 100 times as much energy to operate. Third, we are told that nuclear fusion will someday free up vast <clears throat> areas of land that are currently needed to operate solar and wind power installations. But the entire facility needed to house the 192 lasers and all the other necessary control equipment was large enough to contain three football fields, even though the actual fusion reaction takes place in a gold or diamond vessel smaller than a pea. All this just to generate the equivalent of about 10 to 20 minutes of energy that is used by a typical small home. Clearly, even the most inexpensive rooftop solar system can already do far more. And Professor Mark Jacobson's group at Stanford University has calculated that a total conversion to wind, water, and solar power might use about as much land as is currently occupied by the world's fossil fuel infrastructure. So I do want to, to tell you uh, I, I should have put this warning uh, out there that Brian Tokar is a major, major, uh, you know, huckster, uh, you know, uh, 
mongering this solar and wind turbine. Okay, so this guy, uh, who, I mean, I like the guy, uh, he gets it about fossil fuels and nuclear fusion, but I, I should have mentioned this at the beginning, that Brian Tokar is also a clueless moron about, uh, uh, about wind and solar. Uh, as there have been many articles in, in that I've shared, uh, you, you know, just hitting the bullshit detected button on, uh, on, on what was just said there, that uh, solar and wind power are going to require way more land than fossil fuels. I, I have said uh, several times recently that, it, 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 you know, part of the green, uh, clean, you know, bright green lie energy revolution will result in the single biggest assault on our public lands that you have ever seen. It will leave the acreage towards fossil fuel to hell. I, I bet if you added up fossil fuel development, you, you know, oil drilling and fracking, you, you added that to cattle grazing and logging uh, that uh, what you, what's getting ready to happen to our public lands, but because of this bullshit that this clueless moron, uh, wh whatever this dude's name is, uh, you know, now that I think about it, I, I wish I'd never started this article, but it, anyway, uh, I'm going to try not to throw out the baby with the bathwater, and let's get back to uh, this uh, solar and wind huckster Brian Tokar's spot-on analysis of nuclear fusion. <clears throat> Where were we before I got off topic, although it's not off topic at all? <clears throat> Longtime nuclear critic Carl Grossman wrote on Counterpunch recently, and I almost read this story, and maybe I should have read Carl's story in, instead of this jackasses. Anyway, uh, longtime nuclear critic Carl Grossman wrote on Counterpunch recently of the many likely obstacles to scaling up fusion reactors, even in principle, including high radioactivity rapid corrosion of equipment, excessive water demands for cooling, and the likely breakdown of components that would need to operate at unfathomably high temperatures and pressures. His main source on these issues is Dr. Daniel Jasby, who headed Princeton's pioneering fusion research lab for 25 years. The Princeton lab, along with researchers in Europe, has led the development of a more common device for achieving nuclear fusion reactions, um, blah, 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 which contains much larger volumes of highly uh, ionized gas, uh, blah, blah, blah. This is getting way too technical. Bottom line, they have never come close to producing more energy than is injected into the reactor. The, the laser-mediated fusion reaction achieved at LBL occurred at a lab called the National Ignition Facility, which touts its work on fusion for energy, but is primarily dedicated to nuclear weapons research. Professor M. V. Ramana of the University of British Columbia um, had a recent article which explains that the lab, quote, was set up as part of the science-based stockpile stewardship program 
which was the ransom paid to the U.S. nuclear weapons laboratories for foregoing the right to test after the U.S. states signed the Comprehensive Test Treaty in 1996. Um, anyway, uh, we get it. Uh, but basically, what he's going on to saying that, that what this research was, was basically looking uh, as a way to modernize nuclear weapons. Uh, is, is If you really want to know, I mean, this doesn't surprise me a bit that, uh, that, that this is all uh, weapons research. But be that as it may... Uh, of course, it is the techno-utopians <clears throat> uh, who are, you know, pissing in their pants over this. While some writers predict a future of nuclear fusion reactors running on seawater, the actual fuel uh, for, for both fusion experiments consist of two unique isotopes of hydrogen known as deuterium and tritium. Then he gets way, way uh, too technical here. Uh, if, I, if I started reading out these numbers, you would run screaming into the night, but get to the bottom line, uh, Brian, after all this... Uh, after all of this technical mumbo jumbo, uh, la, 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 la. with half the operating reactors scheduled for retirement this decade, available tritium supplies will likely peak before 2030, and a new experimental fusion facility under construction in France will nearly exhaust that available supply. Uh, in the early 2050s. That is the conclusion of a highly revealing article that appeared in Science Magazine last June, months before the latest fusion breakthrough. While the Princeton Lab has made some progress toward potentially recycling tritium, fusion researchers remain highly dependent on rapidly diminishing supplies. Uh, alternative fuels are, you know, are, are being looked at, but these require temperatures up to a billion degrees to trigger a fusion reaction. Uh, and this other idea uh, also significantly increases the radioactivity of the entire process. Uh, the science article quotes D. Jaspi, form, formerly of the Princeton Fusion Lab, saying that the tritium supply issue essentially quotes makes deuterium tritium fusion reactors impossible, close quote. So why all this, so why all this attention toward the imagined potential for fusion energy? It is yet, okay, I, I'm adding, I, I, I am adding the, the, the first part of this sentence, like Solar and wind energy, like solar and wind energy, that is Sam Mitchell, that is not Brian Tokar. So why all this attention toward the imagined potential for fusion energy? Like solar and wind energy, fusion is yet another attempt by those who believe that only a mega-scaled technology-intensive approach can be a viable alternative to our current fossil fuel-dependent energy infrastructure. 
some of the same interests continue to, pr to promote the false claims that a new generation of nuclear fusion reactors will solve the persistent problems with nuclear power or that massive scale capture and burial of carbon dioxide from fossil fueled power plants will make it p possible to perpetuate the fossil based economy far into the future. It is beyond the scope of this article to systematically address those claims, but it is clear that today's promises for a new generation of advanced reactors is not much different from what we were hearing back in the 1980s, 90s, or early 2000s. <clears throat> Nuclear whistleblower Arne Gunderson, he's a good guy, Arne Gunderson. Uh, I, did I ever interview Arne? I, I honestly can't remember if I ever interviewed Arne or not. I, I know that I invited him. Anyway, nuclear whistleblower Arne Gunderson has systematically exposed the flaws in the new reactor design currently favored by Bill Gates, explaining that the underlying sodium-cooled technology is the same as in the reactor that, quote, almost lost Detroit due to a partial meltdown back in 1966 and has repeatedly caused problems in Tennessee, France, and Japan. France's nuclear energy infrastructure, which has long been touted as a model for the future, is increasingly plagued by equipment problems, massive cost overruns, and some sources of cooling water no longer being cool enough due to rising global temperatures. An attempt to export French nuclear technology to Finland took more than 20 years longer than anticipated at many times the original estimated cost. Uh, as for carbon capture, we know that countless highly subsidized carbon capture experiments have failed and that the vast majority of the CO2 currently captured from power plants is used for enhanced oil recovery, meaning increasing the efficiency of existing oil wells. The pipelines that would be needed to actually collect CO2 and bury it underground would be comparable to the entire current infrastructure for piping oil and gas and the notion of permanent burial will likely prove to be a pipe dream. And then, of course, uh, Brian Tokar just goes off on, uh, you know, selling his solar and wind snake oil. Uh, good Lord, I'm not going to embarrass my uh, intelligence or yours. Uh, but even at the end, even Brian Tokar, who is one of the biggest cheerleaders of the bright green lie of solar and wind, has to uh, have a little bit of a caveat. At the same time, awareness is growing about the increasing reliance of renewable technology, including advanced batteries on minerals extracted from indigenous lands in the global south. Thus, a meaningfully just energy transi transition needs to both be fully renewable and also reject the myths of perpetual growth that emerged from the fossil fuel era. In, if the end of the fossil fuel era portends the end of capitalist growth 
in all its forms, it is clear that all of life on earth will ultimately be the beneficiary. Yes, well, mainly because, uh, and I don't know if Brian is aware of this, is that the end of the fossil fuel era means that at least one half of the population on the planet will starve to death in one growing season. And uh, the population of the planet uh, will, uh, it, it, you know, be cut in half and any pretense at global industrial civilization will go out the window. Uh, because global industrial civilization, not to mention an unsustainable population of 8 billion cancers, uh, is 100% dependent on fossil fuels. Anyway, uh, I'm going to wrap this up and uh, I've got to start packing tomorrow. I am heading out of Bugs in a Jar Farm tomorrow. I'm hoping I will have time for my weekly ecological meltdown roundup rant uh, for our final trip to mongabay.com tomorrow before I get out of here. And before we say Happy New Year, 2023 in three days my guys